We uh, welcome to the pulpit this morning uh, Grace, um, standing in reserve, and, and Lance uh, Earl there from Rockland, Idaho, a little town on your way to to um, to uh, po uh, Pocatello, nowhere. <laughs> so we welcome you this morning. If you would, open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter 2. We're going to start there. But while you're turning there, I just have to share something. I'm, I'm pretty excited. The government is back in business, I guess. I didn't know that until today. When you start something, you're supposed to count the cost. The Bible tells us to do that. And so when Grace and I said, well, what if we retire five years early and go into ministry. Can we make that work? And, and we counted the cost and we decided, you know, we can squeak it out. We can make it happen. And so we took our retirement money. We cashed some stuff out. We paid off our house. We applied for our Social Security. And hers kicked in right away. And the government lost all my military records. So that was a delay that went on and on. And about the time they got that squared around, and all we needed was someone to stamp it approved and let the money start to flow, they shut the government down. And so it's been, it's been crazy, but it's been such a testimony because sometimes we had commitments in our ministry. We, we have actually preached from churches from Tacoma, Washington, down into, into Utah. And uh, we go, oh, gosh, we don't have the money to go. What should we do? We go. And we pray that somehow God will provide. And it's, it's been pretty neat. We've always had gas money to get home, maybe nothing else, but there's always been that. And Jesus has provided. And we just praise him for that. And I think that for us, the government shutdown was a blessing because it allowed us to see God work. And it's been, it's pretty, been pretty amazing. So anyway, we're going to start today in Joshua chapter 2. And while you're turning to that, I just want to remind you of a couple of facts. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights while God was preparing Noah to start again. Moses was in Midian, in the wilderness in Midian, for 40 years while God prepared him to return to Egypt. Egypt was in bondage for 40 times 10 years in Egypt. On Mount Sinai, Moses ascended the mountain twice, and two times he spent 40 days up there as God prepared him to lead the people. They sent spies into the promised land, and they were there for 40 days, preparing for the time when Israel would cross the Jordan and go into the promised land. 146 times the text of the Bible mentions 40. And... If you have several hours to spend, we can cover all of them. Or maybe it would be best if I just skip forward to one last one that I'd like to share. And in Matthew chapter 4, we read about Jesus 40 days and 40 nights, fasting and praying and being tempted in the wilderness as he prepared to begin the ministry that would save all mankind. And so 40 is a, a pretty big number in the Bible, and it always seems to have something to do with being prepared. And I, I think about Israel as they wandered 40 years in the wilderness, always going somewhere and never arriving at their destination. Can, can you imagine how frustrating that would be every time Moses said, okay, roll up your tents, you know, let's, we're going again, going where? We're just going more into more wilderness never arriving at their destination, and how the people must have anticipated. You know, we like to, we like to know where we're going, and we want to get there. And for 40 years, they never had that opportunity to get there. Uh, 40 means a lot for us as well, for Grace and I. In 1976, we were married in the Mormon temple in Ogden, Utah. And in 2016, exactly 40 years later, we went to the foot of the cross. We laid everything there, and we said, God, we have got to know. You see, we had been 
in the wilderness of legalism for 40 years. For 40 years, we had wandered in the wilderness of Mormonism. And we just, we needed a destination. We needed a promised land. And so we went to the foot of the cross and we told God, take everything if that's what you need. Take our, our jobs, our property, our home. God, if it's necessary, take our friends and, and God, even our family, our children. If that is the cost, we have to know. And God showed himself to us. And uh, I'd like to just share a couple of the challenges that we had in our wilderness. You know, I talked about the Israelites always going and never arriving. Man, we had that going on. I remember a verse in the, from the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi chapter 25, 23. It said that grace is applied to us after all we can do. And yet, I never went to bed at the end of the day and looked back over the day and said, today is the day I did it, that I did everything I could have done. You see, I could have prayed one more time. I could have read one more time from the Bible. I could have done something for a neighbor or for a friend. I always went to bed at the end of the day having missed the mark. And so we were always striving and never arriving. Moroni 10 in the Book of Mormon says that God's grace is sufficient for you after you deny yourself of all ungodliness. Now, how do you do that? How do you wipe your life clean of every ungodly trait? And if I was able to do that, why would I need Jesus? Because I would be perfect. You see, we just wandered and we never, we never arrived and we carried this guilt all the time because we always fell short. There were so many changes at the temple when we first went. It was a bl very bloody thing. There was the, the penalties and, and we would pantomime our own deaths. We, we were taught things and told that we had to know these things in order to enter heaven. And then that changed. I, I, I held priesthood positions that no longer exist the gospel just kept changing all the time, and grace kept saying, isn't God supposed to be the same yesterday, today, and forever? But our God wasn't. And so we were always searching, never arriving. Uh, there came a time where there was some unrighteous dominion that really affected our lives, and eventually we, we left. And, and we crossed the River Jordan into the Promised Land, the destination we were always looking for. This is our River Jordan. This Bible where we finally found God, where we finally crossed over and found the inheritance that he always wanted us to receive is our River Jordan. I'd like to share a few thoughts about not the 40 years, but our 41st year. You see, Israel must have thought, once we cross the river and we go to the land of milk and honey, it's going to be so great. There will be no problems, right? But they had battles to fight even after they arrived. And we found out, so did we. So anyway, in, in Joshua chapter 2, I just want to remind you of, of what happened there. This is when the spies were in the promised land, and they went to Jericho, and they met the harlot Rahab, and she hid them in her house and protected them. And they said, when we come back with our armies, hang this scarlet cord out your window. And we will know by that scarlet cord where you are, and you will be protected. And so flip over with me, if you will, to Joshua chapter 6, and we'll dig in. Actually, chapter 5, starting in verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you... For us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Now Joshua fell on his face, and he recognized that this was actually God, and he worshiped God. And then he said, God, what would you have me do? What would you have me know? Do you have a message for me? And God did. Joshua chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. You see, there was a, a military blockade happening there. The people of Jericho were trapped inside. Israel was on the outside. 
And so God said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall flat. <laughs> Did it happen? Just as God said, except for one piece of wall. You see, there was a piece of wall, and a house was built into that piece of the wall. And there was a window and outside that window, there hung a scarlet cord where Rahab and her family were. That piece of the wall and only that piece of the wall stood. And they were protected. Now, the thing is, I think we all have walls in our lives. There are just things that are bigger than us and stronger than us. We can't breach them. We can't get over them. We can't go under them. We can't go through. And so we, we think... Well, how will we do this based on our own strength and our own abilities? And we fail to realize that God's ways aren't ours. While the commander of God's army, well, God, was telling Joshua how things would go, I, I think Joshua must have gotten more and more and more confused. You see, Levi was exempted from war so that they could serve in the temple, right? Right? And here's God's plan, and he says, let the Levites bear the ark around the city. Let Levites carry these trumpets of ram's horns around the city. Well, they don't go to war, but here they were. And he said, for six days you will walk around the city, but on the seventh day you will walk around the city seven times. And blow your trumpets and shout your shout, and the walls will come down. Well, that's six days but the seventh day is the Lord's day. The seventh day is the day of rest. And Joshua must have been thinking, my gosh, why aren't we keeping the law? Why does it not apply? And I think it's, it's pretty obvious when we stop and think about it. You see, the law always pointed to Jesus. The law always showed us a picture of Jesus. The law showed the people who Jesus was and how they were to follow him and that they must follow him. And so that's what the people tried to understand as they lived the law. And on this day, on this particular Sabbath day, they finally got to see it happen because they followed their commander, their God around the city. So on that Sabbath day, they were actually keeping the law because they were following their God. And so when we look at the walls that we have and we think, I don't know how to get over it or around it or through it, we need to realize that God knows and he has a plan if we will follow it. I, I think about the Israelite army as they walked around that city for seven days or for six days. I, I would think that those soldiers looked up at that wall and said, there is no way. There is no way that we will get over that thing or through that thing. Especially when they looked up there and they saw the soldiers of Jericho with their bows and their arrows and their spears and their swords. They thought, it's not going to happen. We can't do it. And they were right. They couldn't do it. You see, that's what we do is we look at the walls in front of us and we think, we can't do this. It's bigger than us. It's stronger than us. It's higher than we can climb. And we don't rely on God. Do we do that? Well, I, th I think we do. My wall, my personal wall, stands between me and my family. And I like the fool I am. I tried to get over it. I tried to knock it down. I tried to bust holes in it. I tried to dig under it. I tried everything I could think to do 
to get over that wall and reach my family. You see, the, the joy of what God has given us is so amazing. I want them to have it. And I couldn't get through. And the more I talked and the more I opened my mouth and the more I thought for myself and the more I did without relying on God's plan, the higher the wall got. You see, my family was on the other side and they were adding stones to the top and they were building it higher and higher. Do you do that sometimes? And so I've, I've thought about this wall and I've thought about Israel. Six days they walked around the city. They didn't say a word. They just did one thing. They followed their God. I've already said enough, probably too much. And so now I'm going to follow my commander. I'm going to do what I do. And I'm going to be silent. And I'm going to wait for him. He will tell me when to shout. And when he tells me, I will. And, and in the meantime, I'm going to pray that as I look at the wall that stands between me and my family, that I will see someone that I love hang a scarlet cord outside the window because they will be saying, I'm ready to hear the word of God. But I also know that whether they do or they don't, whether they are saved or destroyed, God knows best, and, and I have to accept his will. And I have to praise him regardless of how things turn out. And I would ask you, if you have walls in your life, can you do the same? Can you accept God's will if it's not your own? Can you follow God and shut your mouth until he tells you to open it? I'm hoping I can. My wife tells me I'm kind of a big mouth. So I might have trouble, but I'm going to try very, very hard. She's, she's not denying it. So there was, there was another challenge that we found in our first year in the Promised Land. And that challenge is covered really well in Nehemiah chapter 6. So flip over there, if you would. And while you're on your way there, I want to tell you a story. So you're driving along. It's a nice, hot summer day. Maybe your windows are down. It's such a beautiful day. And you're just driving along, and you're enjoying the scenery. You're enjoying the drive. And all of a sudden, oh, skunk. <laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> skunk. So what do we do when we find that skunk? Do we immediately turn around and retreat? Do we give up on, on the destination we had before us and run away? No, we don't do that. Do we stop and introduce ourselves to the skunk, make his acquaintance and chew him out maybe for ruining our drive? Do we do that? Or... Do we lean a little bit harder on the accelerator? Not exceeding the legal speed limit, of course. And press through. We rush through. We keep our sights on what? On our destination. We're going to where we're going to go, where we want to go. We keep our sights focused on the job that's before us, and we move forward. Now, there are different kinds of skunks. There are the little black and white four-legged kind. And there are some other skunks. Nehemiah dealt with skunks. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. So if you would, Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning of verse 2. Now, now Nehemiah was, was back in Jerusalem, and he was trying to rebuild walls that had been destroyed. He was trying to fortify Jerusalem again. And so in verse 2 we read, Zanballat and Gershon sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together. And that goes on and says that they actually had ul ulterior motives. They were trying to destroy or harm Nehemiah. And I want to just share a little bit of my personal story because 
the enemy always tries to harm those who want to follow Christ. That's just what the enemy does. In 2015, I was an active Mormon, and I was politically active. I was writing a column for the Idaho State Journal every Sunday. It was a faith freedom column, and and one day I wrote a column. It had nothing to do with the Mormon church, but it offended the political beliefs of my bishop and stake president. I was called in, I was told, just as the Sanhedrin told Peter and John in Acts 4 or 5, you will never speak of your faith again publicly on penalty of losing your temple recommend. Now, you don't have a temple recommend. Some of you, most of you probably never did. So you don't know that without a temple recommend, you cannot go to heaven. So it's a big deal. Well, I said, uh, no. And I continued to do what I do. And a short time later, I was called in and my recommend was taken from me. And therefore, my pathway to heaven, according to Mormonism, was blocked. It was at that time that Grace and I crossed the River Jordan on our way to Calvary and found Christ. And shortly after that, I was called to an excommunication hearing. I didn't have to go, but I chose to go because there were 16 men there, and I kept thinking, I bet you there's at least one who has questions he can't answer or ask, and I want to go and witness of Christ. So a couple of interesting things happened there. I had told my stake president that I would record it, and when I showed up with, he asked me if I was recording. I said I was, and he said I can't, and I said I can, and he finally said, well, if you do, we'll just cancel the meeting, and I said, okay, and I reached into my briefcase, and I pulled out an audio recorder and turned it off and put it back in. And he said, now, Brother Earl, do you have any other recording devices? I said, yes, I have a whole bunch. They're taped to my body under my clothes. He... <laughs> He laughed, and he said, okay, come on in. I had a whole bunch taped to my body under my clothes. Three more, actually. <laughs> so, and, and it's a good thing that I did because I recognized that the enemies of God always try to harm those who follow Christ. The handbook requires that I can call any witnesses that I choose as long as they're in good standing in the church. And so I called my first witness, said, I called Jesus Christ. And they threw him out of the building. They said, no, we will not hear from him. I said, okay, then I call all of you, 16 men, because I have questions that I think you can't answer. And they were instructed, you will not answer his questions. So I didn't get my witnesses. They said I could make a statement, and they refused to let me make it. And so finally I decided that I would just do it anyway, and I began to speak my testimony of Jesus Christ. And you can hear on my audio, which is available on my website, by the way, you can hear as I start to speak of Jesus Christ, the stake president places a 911 call and says, we have a terrible disturbance, send help immediately. And so the cops showed up, and, uh, and, and that was all, all went away. The enemies always want to harm, just as the enemies of Nehemiah did. A few days later, I received a letter that said, because of my violent behavior during my excommunication hearing, the church now knows that I am a violent risk to all Mormons, and therefore I'm no longer welcome to come on church property to attend church meetings. Which was really interesting, because they wrote that letter not knowing that I had the recording that proved otherwise. Uh, a short time later, my wife's best friend passed away. And we wanted to go to her funeral. We'd been friends with his family for 20 years. And we looked at the letter and it says, we can't go on church properties to attend church meetings. And we thought, well, is a funeral a church meeting? We thought it probably wasn't. But we went and I brought the letter anyway. And I also, of course, had my audio recorder in my jacket pocket. Huh? I just brought one this time. <laughs> so so uh, we were met on the sidewalk, and they looked at the letter, and they said, we see that you can come here. We don't want you here anyway. Go home. And so we left. And that was the end of that, I thought. But the enemies of God always want to harm those that represent God. 
A few days later, the sheriff showed up at my house, and I was charged with criminal trespass. The church was asking for six months jail time and a thousand dollar fine. I spent most of last summer in court, and praise God, charges were dismissed. So this has been this this is an example of my Zan ballot and my Gershom. And the question is not what we do with them, but just what we do about them. How do we respond? And Nehemiah was great. He said, when he received the letter, he sent messengers to them and said, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave and come down to you? You see, the enemy wants to distract us, get us sidetracked so we don't do the work of God. And so the last thing that I received from the church, I received a notice of a of registered mail a few months ago from the legal offices of the Mormon church. And I looked at that notice and I thought, oh, what do I do? And I could pick it up and read their, their mail or, and this is what I did. I sent them a letter and I reminded them of what Nehemiah said. I'm busy doing God's work. Why should I come down? and spend time being distracted by you. And then I added something else, which I think is really great, and forgive me for my pride, but I said, and Jesus fights my battles. Send all future correspondence to him. <laughs> I don't know if Jesus has received anything. He hasn't said anything to me about that, so I, I'm hoping that it's, that it's over. These are the skunks that I've dealt with in my first year in the promised land. Now, when they can't get you through negotiation, then the next step is that they start to accuse you. They did it to Jesus, they did it to Stephen, they did it to Paul, false witness, and they did it to Nehemiah. Starting in verse 6, it says, It is reported among the nations, and Gershom also says, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. At this time, I was, I was really surprised because I actually met other skunks. I thought I knew them all at this point. But I met other, other skunks, and we know that sometimes they come from inside of Christianity, right? There was a small group of, of Christians who said, you cannot go into ministry for at least nine and preferably 13 years after you become a Christian. And I said, well... I'm doing all this under the oversight of my home church pastor. I also work with a, an association of pastors in Pocatello and report to them. I'm going to continue doing what I do. But they said, what, are you trying to set yourself up as an authority over people? And I thought, gosh, no. I'm too dumb to be anybody's boss. And so these, these skunks they wrote an open letter in which they said, Moses waited 40 years to be prepared, and the Paul waited 14, and Jesus waited 30. And I thought, good grief, I just, I just came out of a religion that tries to take mortal men and turn them into prophets, apostles, and God. I'm not applying for any of those positions, Right? And yet they were trying to hold me to those same standards. And they also published something that I found amazing. There's a blog post out there that you can Google. It's called Another or the Second Excommunication of Lance Earl. And they, they're talking about having me excommunicated. I don't know from where. But but they they do that. They say that, you know, you're trying to elevate yourself. You're trying to do this. And I think anyone who enters ministry will face that. They'll say, what are you doing? What are you thinking? What do you want to do? You want to be in charge of other people? You want to stand above other people? You're trying to exalt yourself? No. Jesus did such a work in our lives that I can't not share it. That's really all it is. These are the, the skunks that we have faced. And, and it got me to thinking, well, we all have skunks, don't we? 
In fact, I would say, I, do, I would dare say this. If you don't have skunks or walls in your life and you claim to be a Christian, go out and be a, a more active Christian because Christ says that if we are his disciples, we will always face persecution. So get out there and find some skunks. They're not fun, but they help us grow. And, and I thought, well, so what do we do with this? My pastor in my home church in Pocatello, and he said, when God calls you to a work, just continue doing what God's told you to do until he tells you to do something different. And so that's what we have decided to do in, in our life and, and with our skunks. And the ranting and the threats and the evil and the false witness of these people, it doesn't scare Jesus, does it? Is Jesus afraid of such things? And if, if we are in Jesus and Jesus is in us, what do we have to fear? We just keep moving forward, right? We just keep doing what God asks us to do. If we go move on to, to verse 15, we see that the wall was finished. And I think that if we will continue our work, if we will continue moving forward as God has asked us to do, doing what God has asked us to do, we will find that the work he's called us to will be accomplished in his time, in his way. We will find that nothing can stop it, that there's no power on earth that can change the direction that God has called you to. And so you just move forward. And I would like to close with a couple more passages. So if you would turn with me to Matthew 10. This passage has come to mean a lot to me, and I think you'll see why when I read it. Okay, Matthew 10, starting in verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep amidst the wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts. Yeah, they will. Um, and flog you in their synagogues, and, they will, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you will speak or what you will say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jump over to verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter again, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And finally, I will have you turn to Mark chapter 10. We'll start chapter 10, verse 29. Now, before I read this, we, we always had an escape clause when I was a Mormon. You see, if we read a passage and we said, ah, I don't know if I like that one, Oh, that's one of the ones that wasn't translated correctly because that's the Mormon understanding of the Bible, that it's the Word of God, but only as far as it was translated correctly. And I don't have that escape clause anymore, but this is one that I might want to change if it was up to me. So let's start in verse 29. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, the reason I suggested that maybe I would want to change this a little bit is he promised us that if we are willing to leave those things we love for him, that we will receive 100-fold. 
I say it's so much bigger than that. I've not lost all of these things, but I've lost many. We walked away from so much. But what we gained is not a hundredfold. What we gained is an infinite increase that we can't measure. To have a relationship with Jesus Christ, to know for the first time where my destination is, to know for the first time that I am forgiven, and to understand for the first time in my life that even though I don't hit the mark, I am washed clean by the blood of Christ because I trust and believe in Him completely. It is the most amazing blessing that I can imagine, and it is infinitely more than a hundredfold of what we lost. And here's the crazy thing. It says, it says that we will go on to have eternal life. Have you read the last chapter of Revelation What talks about the city of God, the new Jerusalem? I've received infinite blessings from God already, and I haven't even stepped into that city yet. There is so much more to come, and it is so great. And so my counsel to you, and you don't have to take counsel from me because I'm nobody, but my counsel to you is simply this. Don't be afraid of your walls and your skunks. Fear only God. Follow only God. And he will bless you infinitely for everything you lose. And I just leave you this with my humble testimony that Jesus is enough. <laughs>